Vim, The Tale of Immortality by Dysylvania Episode 3 Lucius's Dream Oh, you're a curious one. It nags at you, doesn't it? Not knowing what happened. What Lucius and the others did. <laughs> well, fret no more, my dear audience. Your book of recollections is here, and you're about to find out. Our protagonists were faced with the daunting task of retrieving the Book of Vim, which promised to bring this new power, this magic, into the world. Lucius was the one who quickly seized the Book of Vim, after the group untied the seven knots that kept it above a dark, ominous pool of water. But then the doorframe that had kept it secured cracked open, releasing the dark liquid into the room and flooding everything. The gush of water forced the group to separate. As you might remember, Hebdom, Yarek and Lucius found themselves on one side, while the rest stood on the other. Then, unexpectedly, Marthys materialized between Hebdom and Lucius who was clutching the mysterious book, and, in that moment, showed his true colors. And here we are, all cut up. Now, let's hear how the tale unfolds, as we learn of Lucius's treason. I did warn you this was a tale of treachery and thievery after all. Lucius began ranting about humanity's enduring oppression and his desire to free them all. And for that, if need be, everyone was unwillingly a means to an end. Not trusting the group's ability to handle the magic, nor Gregory's leadership, Lucius took Yarek hostage, trying to prevent anyone from stopping him. The group banded together to thwart Lucius's treachery. Gregory launched his shield with all his might, aiming to knock the book out of the traitor's grasp onto the ground. Keith took aim with her bow and let loose an arrow that whizzed, shoving the book that struck the ground just inches from Lucius's feet. In a fit of rage, Gregory bravely leapt over the rushing water, calling upon his protector, Mercury. But to his dismay, Marthys conjured a powerful red shield to protect himself, Lucius and his prisoner. However, things took a surprising turn when Mercury decided to join forces with Martis, while expressing remorse over Gregory's need to be made sacrifice. Meanwhile, Gregory put his newly acquired hammer to good use. As he swung, an old astral translucent and green, appeared, taking her place besides the others of her kind and revealing to Gregory that he was marked, rendering him useless now to the astrals and their plans. Still, Gregory hit the shield again, making the ground shake. Something cracked and split, and after a moment from the dark waters, a liquid blob broke through. It flowed, twisting and turning like a worthless mass, then stuck to Gregory like goo. Marthus's face contorted when he realized they hadn't closed the floor door from where the water sprang out, and foresaw what was about to happen. So Marthus and everyone under his shield vanished with the book, leaving behind only chaos and unanswered questions. Soon enough, pushing through the black water depths, much like a face pushed through a curtain, a horrid creature draped in dark veils emerged. Betwixt puffs of dark smoke, Gregory tried to hit the strange apparition, but as he swung his weapon at it, the black, drape-like creature engulfed it alongside its wielder. The chamber shook, stone fell from the ceiling as a strange creature ensnared Gregory with dark drape-like veils and dark wisps of purple smoke. Questions echoed in Gregory's mind and pain exploded in his head. Blood began to drip from his eyes and ears. Keith and Shaq struggled to rescue him and all hope seemed lost 
until Keith tied a rope around an arrow, aimed it to the creature and launched it. Gregory caught the rope and desperately pulled himself out. Breaking free, they found themselves in a deadly race, the creature pursuing them relentlessly through the underground. Long before this, Genevieve had taken the lead and pushed aside a rock obstructing their path. When passing it by, the others moved it out of the way, just enough to escape. Then they attempted to seal the creature inside by blocking the path, but failed. They all kept sprinting towards the cave entrance and met at the end. There they discovered that the stone gate that had marked Gregory before was closed. Though sealed, Gregory opened the door with a swift of his hand. The group ran. Reaching the graveyard, their attention was drawn to a mysterious noise emanating from the base of a nearby statue. A strange elf beckoned them closer. Intrigued, they've uncovered a hidden door concealed beneath the overgrown vegetation. Upon entering, they discovered the elf's chamber where they encountered Paolo Scamacca, a name already familiar to Genevieve. Keith and Jen conversed with Paolo in Elvish, finding out that he had willingly become a dampir. His goal was to rid the old world of vampires, sealing them away in coffins with the help of his two companions, Brutus and Cesar. Their work aligned with Obscuro's vision of a new faith, the Church of Enduring, made of a better race, the Elves, in a sin-free world. Confronting Paolo, Genevieve unveiled him as the same hunter who had trapped her grandmother within the coffin inside the mausoleum La Fevre, which she found during their previous visit to the graveyard. But, as the conversation progressed, they discovered a shared quest with Paolo and his two companions, retrieving magical items from the tomb of time. The white gloves, now adorning Cave's hands, were once the possession of Paolo. Additionally, this revealed that Gregory bore the same branded mark, much like the one of Brutus and Cesar. The one marked first was also the first to die, followed by the other. As they questioned Paolo about how he had lived for so long, he vanished, uttering, I am already dead. The group was stunned as they realized they had just spoken to an apparition. Paolo disappeared, taking all of his belongings with him and leaving behind only smoke curls, guiding them to a trapdoor. They opened it and found Paolo's grave. After a brief rest to heal and eat, they decided to leave and return to the surface. Outside, a wind charged with magic enchanted them and their stolen items were fueled with an enigmatic power, a vibrating hum coming from within them. This granted all four of them newfound abilities from a mysterious source. They also noticed a statue above the concealed chamber, depicting Paolo standing on a pile of vampires, clutching the artifacts Genevieve had taken from her family's mausoleum. Intrigued, Jen quietly revisited the resting place of her grandmother, recovering the two tapestries and finding an empty coffin. Her grandmother missing. The others helped her search around and found strange scribbles near the cave entrance, revealing repeated mentions of Keith's name. Shaklashak also noticed the absence of vampires, discovering the broken chains in the graveyard, a mess of empty broken sarcophagi and worn-out stones. Finding themselves not knowing what to do or what direction to take, Gregory asked their assistance, persuading them to go to Greenwell and help him protect the small village. They decided to leave the old cemetery, but the surroundings were nothing like when they entered the graveyard. They found themselves lost, so they followed the only apparent way, the Purple Road, and after a while, they arrived at the crossroads. A tall wooden totem in the middle catched their attention, depicting a feminine figure with a mask covering most of her face, revealing only her thin lips. 
two horns arched upwards from the side of her mask. Examining it further, they discovered the emotive of stars etched into the totem, a skull crying a river, and various water elements. After a few moments, the totem began to glow, transforming itself into the carving of a man with dreadlocks, pupilless, a square beard, strong cheekbones, and sculpted solar motives that appeared within the wooden structure. They traveled onward, leaving the odd magical totem behind, and they came to a deep river and a half-broken bridge, with no way to cross it. Gregory crafted a bridge from an immense tree trunk. While constructing the bridge, Shaq lifted Gregory up, entranced by the smell of his power. Shaq snapped out of it a moment later and congratulated the big man on a job well done, lowering him down. They crossed and walked through the forest until night arrived. Finally setting up camp, Gregory channeled the power of magic through his Tomb of Time hammer. This manifested a shrub by striking the ground with his newly acquired hammer. The shrub grew wide and tall, enough to provide concealment during the rest. Gregory molded the peculiar blob that had previously attached to his armor into the semblance of a face while in the tomb of Paolo. Now the molded creation clung to Gregory, earning the nickname Shifty. During his watch, Shaklashak realized that he hadn't seen his pet snake Vaj for a while. The snake slipped out of the folds of his shirt to keep him company. As they conversed, a pair of intense orange eyes captured Shak's attention. He went to investigate and discovered a massive black snake with a lupine head emerging from a cave nearby. With a serpentine tongue, this fantastical being was so long that it could probably encircle the world. In hissed tones, they exchanged cryptic words about Shaq's time away and the duties he still had to fulfill for the creature. Morning came and the group resumed their journey getting lost once more. Fate had a twist in store for them. As they exited the forest, they discovered an imposing fortress dominating the landscape. Clusters of villages encircled it like a belt. A glowing star watched over it from above, with a blue river cutting through its walls. They headed towards it along the purple road, and near the gate of the citadel stood a bronze statue. It resembled the slim figure of the man they knew, fancying the same bowl cut and cradling a book in his slim arms. Lucius. A set of guards approached and welcomed them to Greenspring, the capital of the Green Kingdom. Now this is interesting, even for me. I told you I don't know the story, it's still being written. But why is Lucius famous? How come they never have heard of this green spring? The mysteries linger until they don't. I'm pretty sure the adventure will unfold further soon. Now on your way, audience, I need my rest. This was the recap for episode 3 of Vim as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Lermi Loshan, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons & Dragons campaign, Vim, The Tale of Immortality, tune in Sundays at 0500 UTC, youtube.com slash at Dicelvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us and remember, every subscriber keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.